All right, I'm about to make an attempt at explaining how is it that Eric Dollard's analog computer in LMD daisy chain modality can possibly synthesize electricity in a parametric oscillatory format. And so the nice part about the LMD module is that resonance between parametric um, alterations of either capacitors or inductors or whatever and the timing of the waveform is not required because we are not altering the parameter of one of these components twice per wave cycle. We only do it once. And it's due to the fact that in this case of an LMD module, it's the capacitors that are undergoing parametric alteration or excitation and only in the gap between two half cycles. Because when they are charged, see everything's a little backwards here. We know that a capacitor can take a little longer to discharge than um, charging it. And the same goes for coils. Um, but when it comes to the compression and decompression of the dielectric, which is related to the charging and de de uh, discharging um, situation, it's directly related, it's opposite. In other words, a capacitor may charge quicker than it discharges, but it compresses slower than it decompresses. Now we know it compresses and decompresses because we know it happens to an extreme um, example of this feature of the dielectric, and that is um, piezoelectric crystals, coarse crystal oscillators, used for coarse, coarse crystal oscillators. We know it because you can look it up. You can look up the uh, farads of a quartz crystal and you'll get two figures, a maximum and a minimum. Five picofarads versus 0.5 picofarads, a difference of a factor of 10. Needless to say, that's all I need to qualify the dielectric of a capacitor as being in its own way, maybe not as extreme as a quartz crystal, as a parametric oscillator because its dielectric undergoes compression and decompression when it's compression when it's charged and decompression when it before it discharges voltage um, because we know that when you apply voltage to a quartz crystal it changes its dimensions um, or if you apply a mechanical force um, voltage changes will result. Well, that's only because capacitance is changing also. When we change the, when we lower the capacitance abruptly of the dielectric of a capacitor, when we lower the capacitance, we raise the voltage. When we raise, oh, if I got that straight, <laughs> when we raise the capacitance, we raise the amperage. So the voltage and the amperage exchange are one is at the cost of the other. Now, <clears throat> it may not decompress or, or compress a whole lot, but it doesn't matter. Because in an LMD module, where's the energy going to go except back and forth? And this is another thing about an LMD module and about Bessemer's wheel. Bessemer's wheel was the end, uh, the end portion of his uh, circuit, mechanical circuit in which reciprocating motion was being converted into rotary motion so that it could do useful work. Because in our world, all of our machines, for the most part, are rotary. Some are reciprocating, but none are pendulous. Now, pendulous is a reciprocating motion, even though it's an arc rather than a straight line. But it's the pendulum that is parametric, not the circle. And so it's a mistake to think that uh, it's been, we've been making this mistake for ages that a circle, a circular motion can be made 
into an over unity device, it's impossible. It cannot happen because one half of the circle n uh, neutralizes the other half. There's no way you're going to come out ahead or behind for that matter because pa parametric excitation can decompose energy, mechanical energy, just like it can electrical energy or synthesize because at the fundamental level, electrodynamics is mechanics. They are one and the same. Anyway, so an LMD module are two halves of a circle, and each half is a pendulous reciprocating motion. The energy goes in one direction, away from the plate of one capacitor towards the plate of the opposite capacitor, and on the opposite side, it's doing the opposite direction to complement, to make sure these other plates are undergoing the same operation, but in a opposing manner. And then the whole thing reverses itself. And so an LMD module gives us circularity, even though this is not a circle. These are two halves. And this can never be a whole circle unless we take out the two capacitors, both of them. Now, if we only take out one, it's still a broken circle. It's not a whole circle. But you need two capacitors because you need a pendulum. And it's only with two capacitors that you get a pendulum to work parametrically. <coughs> Sorry. It'll be a pen well, it'll be a pendulum, but it'll be a, a tank circuit with only one capacitor. But with two capacitors, it now becomes a parametric tank circuit. And that makes all the difference in the world. Of course, with two capacitors you have to have two coils. Now the two coils could share the same magnetizable core. They could be on the same core or they can be on s their own separate cores. That's up to you. And there's pluses, there's pros and cons of, of each of those choices. Um, but they should have magnetizable cores because the other thing about using an LMD module to parametrically boost power or <laughs> wattage, energy, um, <coughs> I mix it up because I don't know the difference, whatever. <laughs> um, so to me, it's all the same, schmush. Um, <laughs> <coughs> sorry. <laughs> um, where was I? Oh shit, I forgot what I was talking about. Anyway, it's the pendulum that gives us parametric amplification. And you have to put them together, and it creates a semblance of a circle, and it's good enough. It works pretty good because a circle is required for a circuit. Circuit comes from the word circle, but it's not really a circle. It's two reciprocating halves. This is very important that we keep this in mind because we tend to look at a circle and think, oh, that's a circle. No, that's not a circle because this is <laughs> resistance here. So we got two halves. There's no way this can be a circle. All right, enough. Oh yes, the purpose of a magnetizable core to these coils is to remember the voltage down the length of that coil. Without sufficient memory, this thing would run down and it would never amplify. The capacitors here are not a storage device. They don't function that way. It's the coils that serve as a voltage storage device, not the capacitors. The capacitor's sole job is to act in one sense, like a mirror, you know, a bank shot in a, in a game of pool, you bank, you bank a shot off the side of the pool and the ball, ball comes back, but at an angle. Well, in this case, 180 degrees. But in, excuse me, in another sense, the capacitor acts like a diaphragm in which pressure building up on one side is matched by pressure building up on the other side, just of the opposite polarity. So it's kind of like a mirror and kind of like a diaphragm. It's really some of both. But that's it. it. It recoils, it responds to the voltage thrown at it when current comes its way but and when it leaves. But it does not store to any significant duration. That's not its purpose. <clears throat> if we compare these two, when it comes right down to it, it's the coils that store, and it's the capacitors that react. 
Now it's true coils react too with, uh, you know, back EMF and then there's c the collapse of the field as well. You know, all these magnetic reactions. But um, that's not the magic of p parametric amplification. That's just... Um, enhances the richness of what takes place here because it's no longer a simple little wave, you know, that's bouncing around. It gets complicated because we get all these modifications of the wave that the coil is contributing to the situation. And with the, the, the more and more rich the waves become, there actually is a tendency for the waves to increase in frequency. And that, of course, <laughs> um, accelerates the amplification process that this parametric oscillator is undergoing. Anyway, I'm covering Broad's things here, but let's get specific now. How do the capa cap capacitors contribute to parametric amplification? What they do is, well, what I've learned, what I've observed through my simulations of parametric excitation is that a capacitor has to abruptly change its parameter in order for any kind of change in amperage or voltage to occur at all. It can change abruptly upwards in capacitance or downwards, but it has to be abrupt. Now in the case of the NLMD um, module, it only happens once, not twice. And so it's always synthesizing, it's never decomposing energy. Now, it, I shouldn't say always, it's, it, it never decomposes, but it can synthesize. But sometimes it can also do nothing and just sit there. And sometimes it can run itself down. So you get about four options. And this is due to the fact that you have to have resonance between the capacitor and the coils. Now, what kind of resonance? I never knew until now. I, I think what John Bedini, because Eric Dollard said the same thing in his own way recently. John Bedini called it impedance matching, and that's exactly what Eric described <coughs> during the latest 2018 uh, conference. They do, um, uh, what do they call it, a round table. You know, the presenters get up on stage all at once, and say a little bit about themselves and then answer field questions and they had it in two parts and the second t part Eric was asked uh, two very pertinent questions what was his favorite experiment and something else I can't remember about the Sun something about the Sun uh, running the show you know um, in, a, in a way different than what physics tells us um, but the first one you know what was your favorite experiment that was when he he described an analogy to one of his experiments and the way he described that analogy reminded me of what John Bedini said but in Eric's own way that if you have to match the resistance of the capacitor with the resistance of the coil to get them to resonate. Now every component in an electrical circuit shares in capacitance, shares in having the ability to have inductance, and also resistance, simple resistance, but not to the same degree. So inductors are very good at being inductive, but they also have some resistance, and maybe not a whole lot, and some capacitance between each turn of wire. And a capacitor has inductance, and I <laughs> far be it from me to understand that statement, but it also has resistance. Well, um, where was I going with that? Oh, so we have to match the simple resistance of the capacitor with the simple resistance of the coil to get, to get them to resonate. Now, since I don't know how to engineer that because I'm not an engineer, I just try different values until I find it some, you know, I get results. And the matching is a bit of a window. You know, you get a little wiggle room sometimes. Sometimes you can find, usually you can find it. It just varies what that wiggle room is, what it amounts to. In my latest, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, in my latest simulation, I used capacitors of 10 farads, 
I also used additional capacitors of one farad each to boost the 10 farad, but that was, that's a separate issue I don't need to go into because that has to do with the circuit in involved. Um, the circuit was is.gd forward slash um, two LMDs shorted, and I'll show you a screen shot of that circuit at the end of this video along with its shortcut URL that you can go see it in action and play with it. Um, where was I? <laughs> oh no. Ah, my train of thought. Uh, before I gave the little advertisement, the self-promotion, I forgot what I was talking about. Oh dear. Yada, yada, yada. Well, <laughs> that's life. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, when current in the traditional flow pattern, uh, coming away from positive, going towards negative, um, during one half cycle, let's say the first half cycle, light blue here, it's going counterclockwise, um, it charges up the plate and creates compression in a circular fashion opposite to what I've drawn here. And, it's d and it does that compression in a gradual manner. Now it does it, one way it does it, Eric Dollard says what happens is when the plates have increasing opposing voltages you know, on either side, on either plate, it draws them together, it, it attracts them to each other and that compresses the dielectric. There's another way, I believe, and that's simply the fact that when the dielectric is being charged, its voltage is going up, which means its capacitance is going down. Because when you do a parametric oscillation, and when you lower capacitance, the voltage goes up and the amperage goes down. And Basically, I'm saying this is a bidirectional reality in which if you do anything that's related to something else, it doesn't matter which, which is the cause and which is the effect. You'll always get associative pairs of parameters matching up. It's just the way it is. There's, there's you know, electricity is the simplest consciousness that we can imagine of a living being. It's really quite simple, but in its utter simplicity of consciousness, it is a living being, and our circuit is a body that gives it a place to function in, and a, um, a directive, a command on how to function. Um, anyway, so it doesn't matter which, which you do. do. You know, it, it's the same thing with quartz crystal oscillators, quartz crystals. Do you compress them mechanically, or do you charge them with voltage? The end result is going to be both. It doesn't matter which you do. So why should it be any different with a regular capacitor? It's not. It's just less extreme. But it still happens, and that's all that matters, because it's going to build up, because I'm, I'm going to show you why in a minute, in a, this second. So when it compresses, due to the charging process, the, the voltage is going up, but it's gradual that the compression goes up. Um, the voltage may not be. The voltage may be leading, in terms of time, the compression of the dielectric, because it's dragging the dielectric along. But that means the, the charging process will be quick, but the compression will be slow. But when it comes time for the polarity of this capacitor to, s to switch, to swap sides, just be f in the gap between two half cycles, in between the first half cycle counterclockwise and the second half cycle clockwise, it now decompresses, but very suddenly and very abruptly, because there's no pressure on either side. There's no polarity of voltage on either side in that gap. There's no, you can't say there's positive and negative. So actually, it was wrong of me to put these symbols here, now that I think of it. 
it's misleading because I'm actually describing the second half cycle by putting these symbols here so I should color these red okay let's do that do I have a no I don't I have to do it or else what good am I let's see we gotta change the size of this and then we gotta get some red color whoopsies Meh. Kind of convincing, not exactly. <laughs> hmm, I have a little bit of pink there. Let's get rid of that pink. All right. Yes, they should be red. That makes more sense. I'll have to redraw it. Well, I'll just redraw it, but for the moment, this will be temporary. All right. So when this decompresses in the gap, actually, those signs shouldn't even be there. Dang. They should be in parentheses is what they should be in. To imply it without actually being there yet right because that's what's projected to occur got it so I'm projecting that I'm going to get okay now I'm gonna have to redo it all together whoopsie what am I doing I don't know what I'm doing red oh I see I have to erase it first I'm uh, sorry to take your time out here, but I have to do this or I lose my train of thought. All right, where am I here? This is how I get my special characters. I keep them saved for special occasions. <laughs> oh, that's a secret. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, well, <laughs> some secret. All right, now where did I put everything? The second half cycle traditional comes out. That means, um, no wait, positive went in. So now positive has to be on this side. That means negative is down here, right where I put it. Oh, shit. I'm supposed to, damn it. <laughs> I hope you love my uh, use of the uh, foreign tongue. We won't say which one so as not to incriminate anyone. All right, there we go. Looks like it's a little on the high side. Uh, uh, that looks too weird. Let's try that again. Let's try this one. And that looks even weirder. Hmm. <laughs> That's not so bad. Maybe it should have just been parentheses. Okay, that's better. So it's in, whoops. It's implied. Okay, so negative would go up here. And then we do positive. This would be the right polarity of the second cycle. All right. So, yeah, because positive, this direction of current means it's coming from positive. Uh-oh. <laughs> and that's true. It is coming from a positive. Okay. So this would have been positive. This would have been negative. But then on the return rebound, 
Oops, I got it backwards. Darn. Yeah, I would get it backwards. So when the current was flowing, it was flowing from a positive to a negative, and then in, in reverse during the second half cycle, it's flowing from a negative to a positive. Oh no. Oh shoot, the other way was better. <laughs> plunk, 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 plunk. Okay, so this is the voltage that's going to be once the voltage leaves the capacitor. Now it leaves it in both directions, even though the current is only leaving it in a particular direction. But actually, right, well, it leaves and it enters in a unidirection. <coughs> so when the, uh, a capacitor undergoes charge, the current comes, came in, but it was also leaving on the opposite side. <coughs> And then during the second half cycle, the current enters the left side of this topmost capacitor, then leaves on the right side. But the voltage, the, the influence of voltage goes back out in both directions during each half cycle, particularly at the beginning of the half cycle when the uh, capacitor is discharging. In any case, the exiting of the influence of voltage is gradual. By comparison to the parametric alteration, which is quite sudden and abrupt, prior to the start of the second half cycle in the gap between the two half cycles, because there's no voltage, no um, pushing, no pulling. The, c the dielectric is in a neutral condition, and so it can spring back abruptly. And that's when we get the drop in capacitance, th the rise of voltage of what is stored. So it is temporarily stored there, but only for the purposes of manipulating it parametrically, to increase it parametrically at the expense of amperage, which is okay, because all we have to do is build up voltage, and then when we, when we want to drain this thing, we can drain it in parallel to the coils. We can drain the two coils in parallel to, to them, for what uh, you know, whatever amperage can come out of those kilovolt coils, you know, my simulation at uh, cruising speed for an EV, 50 uh, amps, supplied a DC drain for a DC motor, or a DC operation of a universal motor actually, because during a surge, everything is um, AC. It's it's oscillatory. But so it has to accommodate both, and even in the drainage, the voltage is um, a slow carrier wave of uh, AC, and what rides on that slow wave is a much uh, faster wave. So there's still it's not entirely DC, even though it may look that way when we look at the simulation of the thing. I might as well get you a picture to show you what I'm talking about. Um, Do I have one here? No, I never put it here. Naughty, naughty. I should have put it there. All right, let's see. Where's the picture? Here it is. So let's increase the size. So when we look at these waves, they look pretty flat, but well, the, the amps is. The amps is very flat, but the volts 
undulates up and down. And it has a certain thickness to the line which shows, indicates to me that it's actually a very highly compressed, very uh, short wave, fast cycle time of an alternating sine wave. It's just that at this time step of five microseconds, we can't see that. But I've seen it on other simulations when I change the time step. I can find out what's going on. W why is the line not f uh, thin? Why, is have, why does it have a certain thickness to it? It's because it's not a line. It's not a DC flat line. It's an, a, an AC compressed wave that I just can't see the up and down motion because it's so compressed in time that I can't see it. Um, But this is the circuit that I'm referring to, and this is the shortcut to it, if I can get to that, is uh, is.gd forward slash two LMDs shorted, all one word. And that's the, um, and it works in uh, Java as well as JavaScript, but you'll get different impedances between the voltage and the amps when you drain it in drainage mode. But during the surge, it's all about voltage and very little amperage. And so that's what I'm focusing on. If I can get back to... Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm focusing on in this video, is the process by which the, pr the, um, the LMD module of Eric Dollard... I want to keep saying Sir Eric. <laughs> um, keeps parametrically amplifying the energy overall, but mostly in the with voltage leading. Now, the gap between voltage and amps does not broaden. It doesn't change. Um, whatever it starts out at, let's say it's 10 million volts per uh, unit volts per unit of amps, it just maintains that distance, that fact factor of a difference, that ratio of a difference. Um, and both will raise logarithmically at the same rate, so they maintain that difference but they change logarithmically based on the energy that's stored temporarily in the dielectric. The voltage gets raised before it discharges, after it finishes charging, you know, just as the cycle, just as the half cycle is switching polarity, switching direction. But it's because of um, response times that makes all the difference, and this is why an LMD module can only synthesize if it does anything parametrically, parametrical. It'll only be synthesis. It will never be decomposition. So you can't go wrong. You know, this is the, w the way I've felt from the beginning intuitively without actually knowing why or anything. When I first bought my RAV4 EV from two th of 2002, I'm the third owner. I'm not proud of it. It doesn't run at the moment. It's a dead car with nine dead batteries. But I bought it to dedicate myself to put myself at risk, to try to find out a way to improve the situation because sociologically I could see what was going on. It was, it's ridiculous the way our electric cars are not favored in their engineering uh, by comparison to gasoline cars. Um, so I wanted to commit myself and so I got involved by purchasing a car and then I found out how inconvenient it is to have a short range and how long it takes to charge the batteries and how ridiculous it is to have batteries as the basis for an electric car because you're draining a voltage source and Toyota uh, rep Repair r admitted to me it's all about amps. All The only reason for having lots of volts, well there's an additional reason for having lots of volts in a, in a battery pack and that's torque. But that means you get a either you get a, a motor rated at higher voltage to handle the higher torque to move around a heavier car, such as the RAV4 EV is extremely heavy. It's over 3,000 pounds. Not unlike uh, Tesla's uh, AC conversion of the Pierce Arrow, which is over 4,000 pounds. So you need a lot of volts to handle the increased torque required to move around a heavier object. But the main reason is to serve as a, a, a larger voltage source to drain to convert into current because the motor's going to ultimately run off of current in a DC situation, a DC motor. With uh, AC, of course, it's frequency, but, you know, frequency and current tend to match directly, one-to-one, -one, as it is anyway. 
In fact, they run, uh, Tesla Motors runs their uh, AC motor at a very high amperage, around one and a half kilo amps, while most DC motors in a DC electric car run at around 50 amps for cruising and 200 amps for uh, acceleration, full throttle acceleration. I won't say by and large, it probably varies somewhat. Um, but a normal car only has a 144 volt battery pack because it only has one motor, but the RAV4 AV has two motors and thus they had to double the pack. 24 12 volt modules, 95 amp hours each to give it a, a total voltage of 288 volts because all the batteries were, were wired in series to run two motors. And the way it was described to me by Toyota, the motors run off of each, they feed each other. They run off of each other. That tells me a closed loop within the circuitry that feeds them energy. Be that as it may. It may. And I use that in my uh, simulation, if I can get to it. You'll see I've got two coils and two coils. Um, but when it drains, they both drain in the same direction. So it doesn't really apply. Some of, one of my others does. Yeah, this is designed for... Um, Java, and for the earlier version of JavaScript version of Paul Fawcett Simulator, before I monkeyed with it and added equivalent series resistance, which changes things to a very large degree. Um, so this circuit only works under those conditions. I have another one that works under um, my more recent real s realistic simulator that has equivalent series res resistance in all of its caps and coils. Um, because they, they don't work in, in the two different systems very well. <laughs> They're not cross, which shows you that we don't fully understand what's going on. If, I, if one simulator has got to be different from another, which one is more realistic, I don't know. But I, I try to do things in multiple simulators to some degree so that I can have a broader understanding or appreciation, at, at the very least, of what I'm trying to deal with. It helps. <laughs> it helps not to base yourself on just one simulator. Um, let's see if I've covered everything. I think so. Yeah. So this is my third draft of this video. It's taken me a little while to be able to... As it is, you saw, I was still making changes to the diagram, but minor. They're not really intrinsic to the operation. I understand now it, the abrupt change only happens once during each half cycle, not twice like it normally would if it was strictly a, a parametric um, device, such as Chris Carson's replication of, um, you know, uh, of an electrostatic rotary generator. Um, that thing, um, pro yeah, well that thing probably parametrically oscillated twice. Um, and it has to be before each half cycle terminates or in the gap between the two half cycles. So this is perfect because this verif this goes along with what I've already tried, already attempted to figure out what I've seen. Actually, because I've trained myself in working with the simulator, when resonance, when um, timing is required as to when these parametric alterations occur, you have to do them just before the half cycle term turns or terminates before the energy turns around or in the gap between the two half cycles, if you can do it. But you can't go over because if you go over the half cycle, then the energy decomposes. But here, it'll never do that because the abrupt change happens only in one direction and not the other. So I it's a guarantee using this LMD module th that your chances of parametrically amplifying energy are vastly improved. I mean, that's a guarantee. You know, it's not a guarantee that you'll succeed, but it's a guarantee that you probably will succeed. You just got to monkey with it and get impedance. In, in all likelihood, it's probably impedance matching. But whatever it is, it's a matching of some type between the caps and coils. So if one is large, the other has to be large to a certain degree. And it's not a linear relationship. So you don't just multiply uh, one and then multiply the other to match. It doesn't work that way. So um, <clears throat> probably because resistance varies as inductance changes, 
you know, I assumed in the realistic simulator that for the purposes of the simulation, I had to arbitrarily choose that it was a linear relationship, but I know now that it, that's not the case. Resistance on a coil is never the same ratio proportion proportion to its inductance at the same rate of ratio over the varying inductances possible that a coil can exhibit. Um, so my arbitrary choice of 40 ohms per Henry is quite arbitrary because it's not fixed at all, let alone the fact that it's arbitrary, but the fact that I made it fixed is bogus. It's not fixed. It varies. Now with a capacitor, it varies according to the material of the dielectric. If it's ceramic, it tends to be around 10 milliohms, but you can have a lot of other dielectrical materials such as the vacuum that'll change um, the resistance of that dielectric. In any case, I suspect, I have good reason to suspect you have to match the resistance of the capacitor with the resistance of the coil, not you know, the, the simple resistance, and to get them to match in a resonant fashion so that you can get them to work together in this LMD module. I don't know if that's true, but I suspect that's, that is the case. If, you, if you're an engineer, you know, and you're going to engineer it, then that's what you would shoot for, is my best guess estimate. Because Eric Dollard has said that, and John Bedini said it, but with um, applied to a different situation, not this. But Eric did say it with regard to this situation of caps and coils. I mean, he really, he, he's been uh, encouraging it of late. So, you know, when somebody encourages something, it's good to uh, perk up your ears and take notice. Well, I've been simulating the LMD module on and off for over a year now, although I've simulated other situations that were parametric as well, not the LMD module. But I started with the LMD module because I didn't know what else to use to, to start with. And it was my belief, strictly a belief, a feeling, a, a hunch, when I bought my RAV4 EV, that it would be the LMD module that would ultimately answer the challenge that I made to myself. And... It, it, it's come full circle to this because when we look at various circuits or when I look at various circuits that I simulate, part of the problem is manageability. How can you match? Because this is very explosive when you start to surge energy. It can explode in instantaneously. It's, it's really disastrous or it's very hazardous, <laughs> very dangerous, which is probably why most people don't want to go here, come here. Um, but the other problem is that voltage tends to dominate over amperage. And I didn't realize it's a simple um, challenge of geometry on how to properly drain a circuit filled with voltage such that you get a drop in voltage <coughs> and, a, and a humongous rise in current. It's really a simple matter. And there were two techniques I had to use. One was I had to short out the pair of coils on the right with the pair of coils on the left with the help of a mechanical switch. But to take it further, I had to short out the two lines with the resistor, but between the two switches so that the resistor stays out of the circuit during surge mode and only gets engaged during drain mode when these two drainage channels are engaged, these two wires, t sets of uh, circular loops. Um, and then it's ridiculous the amount of um, the drop in, in impedance depending on how you simulate it. If you simulate it in uh, Java, Paul Falstead's earlier JavaScript uh, simulator version, you get something on the order of 400 nano ohms of impedance. But if you use J um, if you use my uh, equivalent series resistance oriented simulator, you get something on the order of about 150. Actually, it's not 182. It's more like 150 micro-ohms of impedance. But still, that's, that's a shocking drop of voltage by comparison to amps. I mean, it's really amazing that I was able to come up with this, but I guess I, ha I must have had good karma. I don't know. <laughs> um, now, the reason for the extra capacitors... All it needs is 10 farads and one Henry on 
the core on the each coil of the tran of these three transformers that are making two modules that are bounding the space of two two LMD modules. But in but that's just a surge without the possibility for drain. I have to add in the possibility for another phase, and that is the drainage phase. So that's why I added these stacked in parallel one farad capacitors with switches, with mechanical analog switches. These are not transistors. These are these are not MOSFETs. These are mechanical analog switches. And they have a 10 giga ohm resistance when they're open and a 20 ohm resistance when they're closed. And they also have, I suspect, a certain amount of leakage. You know, there's always some leakage that goes on in a switch. And so there's you can't just replace this with a bunch of uh, resistors and some other switches. It don't work that way. <laughs> um, but these switches have to withstand humongous voltages. In order for me to get this to run at 50 amps, and what does this say here? Just under 10 millivolts? Do you know how much I have to raise the voltage of um, the inductors, mind you? During surge mode, I have to raise it to 20 mega volts. And only when I release that the circuit from surge mode in, and, and cause it to go into drainage mode does the voltage suddenly drop down to 10 millivolts. <laughs> but the amps stays there. Well, no, the amps jumps up slightly. Yeah. So wh whatever the amps were during surging, when I go to drain, the amps jump a little. But mostly the voltage drops tremendously. Um, so if you've got 20 megavolts versus, um, I think this was milliamps over here. I can't remember. That's a huge difference. That's a billion to one or 20 billion to one of volts versus amps. And we talk about impedance and the heating of coils or heating of components or the shattering of the dielectric of capacitors. We got a lot of stress going on in here. And th so there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? So you make up the difference for not having an exterior voltage source, one vo volt battery here. You only use in the beginning to, to uh, energize this with a slight charge. And then the rest is parametrically amplified. The cost is not in an energy source. Now the cost is stress. You're going to be stressing this circuit and you're going to be stressing the nearby environment if you're not careful about how you, how you um, build this. You know, you'll, you'll be creating radio interference in your local environment if you're not careful and have the FCC down on your head in no uncertain terms. So there, nothing's for free per se. It's just free in the sense now we don't have to pay in this in this in the form of energy. Uh, and the gain is huge when it comes to energy. We're paying in terms of stress, is what we're doing. I mean, we may be paying in other ways, but stress is the most obvious one right off the top. I can you know it's the f easiest thing to um, observe in this in this situation. Um, so what we have here are 12 capacitors that are part of the circuit. This one out here is just to balance the two switches and make sure that the charging of the two sides or the two uh, LMD modules is more or less equal. Because I don't like it when it's not equal. I like these two pairs of coils on either side to be more or less equal in their charge, which is going to be based on the charge of this, the two coils on this central spine transformer. If they are equal, then everything else will be balanced horizontally for the most part. Uh, this leftmost coil will match the voltage of the rightmost coil of this transformer, but then this one's going to be severely dropped during drainage. Uh, during a surge, that's another matter. They'll probably all, all six coils will be similar. But it took t uh, 12 capacitors in this arrangement, which just happens to be the number of so-called radio tubes, vac vacuum tubes, that Tesla bought in Buffalo immediately prior to his EV conversion demonstration of the Pierce Arrow in 1931. What if those vacuum tubes were not radio tubes, as everybody says on the internet, it's such a popular story these days, but if instead those vacuum tubes were, were capacitors, not necessarily variable capacitors, because I use switches instead, 
to get the same result. I thought I had to use variable capacitors, but I'm mistaken. Because you, you're not going to be able to do, it's not buildable to use variable capacitors, but it is buildable if you, if you use mechanical switches. Possibly buildable. <laughs> more likely. It's more likely to be buildable if you do it this way and just add extra capacitors. But you have to add extra because the switches add resistance. Now the resistance they add is both positive and negative depending on um, the phases of, of the operation of this circuit. They are positive resistors, but they do accelerate things, which me tells me they're acting in a negative resistance fashion. So that's why mechanical switches are so superb, <laughs> and why it's better just to have extra capacitors instead of a variable capacitor. I was so wrong in my thinking a, f a few months ago, oh, I have to use a variable capacitor. No, it's not buildable, and it does, it's not as efficient as using um, static capacitors with switching. You switch the extras in and out of the circuit. These 10 are always in the circuit, but the extra 8 1 farad capacitors come and go based on whether these switches are open or closed. Um, it only takes 2.5 volts to open and close all of these switches, um, and I get them all coordinated, except these t pair are by themselves, and they're just to initiate. And this capacitor of one microfarad is an arbitrary value I chose. I, I don't even think it matters what the what it what it is, just so long as you have something here to separate, to give a voltage uh, difference, a pol polarization on either side of this the dielectric of this capacitor, because you've got the battery on one side, yet you want to charge both of these modules to the same degree with absolute magnitude, but it's going to be opposite polarity of charge. And now I'm going to shut up. Thank <laughs> you.